Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are uh, looking at uh, sympathetic stimulation on uh, the heart, the, well, the effects of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Okay, so we're just having a revision of how you get excitation contraction coupling in both ventricular myocytes and atrial myocytes and how they're different and how uh, and when, then once we've done that we're going to look at how we can increase uh, the force of contraction of a cardiomyocyte and then we'll discuss how uh, beta adrenergic stimulation uh, via noradrenaline which is released from these postganglionic sympathetic neurons is actually going to achieve that okay right so uh, what we've seen so far is that the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which has been activated by the arrival of an action potential along this T-tubule membrane, uh, releases calcium into what's known as the dyadic cleft of this calcium signal between the plasma membrane and the SR membrane. The calcium diffuses across the dyadic cleft and is going to bind to type 2 ryanodine receptors. So I now want to discuss the type 2 ryanodine receptor in a bit more detail. So here's uh, the membrane of the SR. Okay, and here is our type 2 ryanodine receptor sitting within this membrane. Okay, drawn a little bit larger than it was there. Okay, now the type 2 ryanodine receptor is basically made up of four separate proteins. So it's a oligomer, or a tetramer in fact, specifically a tetramer, of four different proteins. Now, when you build a ryanodine receptor, there are actually three genes that you can use. There is the uh, ryanodine receptor type 1 gene, okay, which will make you a type 1 ryanodine receptor protein. Then there is the ryanodine receptor 2 gene, okay, which will make you a type 2 ryanodine receptor protein. And finally, there is the ryanodine receptor type 3 protein. Now, when they come together to make tetramers like this, thankfully, it's very simple. You have to make homotetramers. It's the only way that nature does it. You only make homotetramers of the ryanodine receptor. Um, you don't make heterotetramers. So each one of these proteins is basically a quarter of the receptor. And if you want to make a full receptor, you have to go to one of these genes, make it four times, so make four proteins from that, genes, that gene, and then bind those four identical proteins together in the tetramer to make a homotetramer. So when I say the ryanodine receptor 2, I mean a homotetramer of the type 2 ryanodine receptor protein. Okay, now, so another fun fact about the um, ryanodine receptor proteins. These proteins are absolutely massive. They are giants in the world of proteins. Each one of them is approximately 5,000 amino acids long. And I realized that in the um, previous video on contraction of cardiomyocytes, uh, I said that they were 4,000 amino acids wrong. I got that wrong. This is the correct statistic. They are 5,000 amino acids long. Okay, so they are massive, great proteins. Big, big proteins. And you are sticking four of these together. So you are getting a receptor which is around 20,000 amino acids. These things are visible when you do electron microscopy. They are giants in the world of proteins. Okay, right. In addition, let's have a look at a bit more. How does the type 2 ranadine receptor get calcium extremely quickly? Basically, it doesn't exist in the membrane on its own. It exists, in a it exists in a complex with two other types of protein. So I'll show these here. So here are two proteins that exist complexed with the type 2 ranadine receptor. And these two proteins are by the name of junctin, which I'll have in turquoise here. So this turquoise protein is a protein known as junctin. So let me write its name down here. So this is a junctin. Okay. And this other protein here, which I will put in violent purple here. Okay. So this is this other protein. This is a protein known as triadin. And junctin and triadin can both bind to another protein. So let's show them bound to another protein. So here is another protein that they are bound to. And we'll have this other protein in orange. So in orange here is this next protein. And this, this protein is 
by the name of calciquestrin. So this is calciquestrin. Okay, and this sequesters calcium ions. And by the way, calciquestrin is often abbreviated to CSQ. So if you ever see CSQ in biology, it might refer to calciquestrin. Okay, so basically, calciquestrin is a protein which combines two calcium ions. So, the type 2 ranadine receptor exists in a complex with junctin and triadin, which themselves are bound to this calciquestrin protein, which is bound to calcium. So you have a lot of calcium in the vicinity of this type 2 ranadine receptor. So, what happens? When the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel opens upon stimulation by the action potential that's propagated down that T-tubule, it's going to allow calcium to move in from the extracellular space, this so-called calcium spark that. The calcium will diffuse across the dyadic cleft and will activate this type 2 ranadine receptor. The type 2 ranadine receptor will open and release calcium from the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen. This phenomenon of calcium inducing calcium release is known as calcium induced calcium release, nice and sensibly. Okay, and this is extremely important for, um, for acting for amplifying these calcium sparklets so that you allow them to create a larger calcium signal. So calcium-induced calcium release. And calcium-induced calcium release is often abbreviated to CICR, kicker. Okay, so if you see kicker referred to, it means this induction of the release of calcium from the SR by the calcium coming in from the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so the type 2 ranadine receptors are going to open, release calcium from the sarcoplasma reticulum. This is going to cause calcium to go up in the vicinity of this uh, type 2 ranadine receptor. That calcium signal has a name itself. Instead of a calcium sparklet, it's called a calcium spark. So, in fact, the calcium spark that was named after the calcium spark. The calcium spark is bigger than the calcium spark that. So, you get calcium released from the SR, and that causes a rise in calcium locally, and that rise in calcium is called a calcium spark. In addition, whilst you're getting a rise in calcium here, you're getting a drop in calcium within the SR around the uh, type 2 ranadine receptor. And that drop in calcium around the type 2 ranadine receptor in the SR, that's known as a calcium scrap. So the drop in calcium in the SR around the type 2 ranadine receptor is known as a calcium scrap, which is basically just calcium spark, but then you take this park bit of the word spark and you spell it backwards to get scrap. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Now, what happens is if you are getting these calcium sparks all over the place, so you have another calcium sign up here, another one here, another one here, another one here, you're getting all these calcium sparks happening all over the place in the cell, what that is going to cause is it's going to activate um, contraction, basically. So the calcium signal now activates contraction. So the release of calcium here activates the sarcomeres to start contracting. Okay, and if you want to know more about how it actually activates contraction, I suggest that you watch my video on cardiac muscle contraction. It, I can't go into it now because it would just take, it would make this video too long. It's going to be massive anyway. Uh, so you, the calcium signal now is where we'll stop with this story because all that matters basically from now on is that we are trying to increase this calcium signal. Okay, so the calcium signal causes contraction. Okay, now how is um, the um, how is the this different in the atrial cardiomyocytes? Well, basically, in the atrial cardiomyocytes, what you have as well is the SR. And it forms these same sort of tree-like structures where it has these processes coming off. But this time, it doesn't have any T-tubules. So actually, the only processes of the SR that are going to form these calcium synapses are going to be the ones that are actually forming synapses with the normal plasma membrane, the sarcolemma over here. Okay, So these are the only actual active calcium synapses. But in these calcium synapses, the same thing is happening as is happening here. So you'll have L-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the plasma membrane, and you'll have type 2 ranadine receptors in the um, 
sarcoplasm in particular membrane. So, basically all over the sarcolemma you will have these calcium synapses. So when the cardiomyocyte undergoes an action potential, what's going to happen is you're going to get calcium going up in the periphery of the cell. Now the question is, will you get it going up in the sort of belly of the cell? And the answer is no, not under resting conditions. In resting conditions in the heart, when the heart, when you know, when you're sitting down and relaxed, the atrial myocytes will only be getting the arising calcium around their periphery. So you'll only be getting contraction of the sarcomeres that are in the periphery, okay? So, uh, how, it, well, there's an obvious way that we can increase the ability of the atrial myocyte to contract, therefore. If we spread the calcium signal further in, if we, um, you know, we, if we increase the calcium signal so that it's all over the place in the atrial myocyte, then that should increase uh, the inotropy of uh, the cardiomyocyte. Okay, right. So, now let's discuss how we can increase the force of contraction of a ventricular cardiomyocyte and the force of contraction of an atrial cardiomyocyte. But we'll do that in the next video.